I think what I talk about today will build on, hopefully will build on stuff that we've talked about in the past. Um, for students who are here, and also for my students, hopefully it'll build on stuff we've talked about in the past. For students who are in the room, I'll do a little bit of a review. But really, my goal is to talk a little bit about um, some efforts uh, that I'm involved with in terms of trying to encourage innovation in a developing country like Thailand in a region like Southeast Asia. So we've got our chunk here from Thailand. I'm curious about other people. Are there any other people from Asia here? From Turkey? OK, great. India? Japan? Any other countries? China? Hong Kong? OK, great. Nobody from Southeast Asia outside of our gang? Somebody okay. in the back. Thank you, Juan. I know you. <laughs> great. OK, so from Thailand. And then the rest, I guess, are based uh, in, in or near Palo Alto or, or somewhere in the region. So um, so let me, let me jump into this a little bit. And really what I want to start with is, is a perspective which is my perspective of you guys who are based here. Um, maybe it's also your perspective of you guys based here. But this is kind of how I see entrepreneurship over, I've been working in entrepreneurship development now for about 15 years. So um, as Richard said, I've been in Thailand since 1992. Most of my work is in the physical world. I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, in 1992, the problems were not internet type problems. They were manufacturing problems. That's how I got to Thailand originally. And um, got involved with a number of companies that I've started. And then that led me to wanting to go back to a university, like happens here, and look for new opportunities. Unfortunately, I didn't find a single opportunity. Instead, I found a whole bunch of students and got more involved in the entrepreneurship and innovation development rather than a single venture or a single business. So that's been going on since around 1999. And in that time, I've seen a progression, maybe of entrepreneurship worldwide, but certainly a progression of how entrepreneurship is viewed in, in Southeast Asia, especially at a policy level. And that's kind of where I'm going to focus today. Um, I think some of it is generalizable to the world in general outside of Silicon Valley or outside of Boston or outside of just a couple of other areas. Um, other parts are generalizable, generalizable to the developing world. And some of it's probably focused mostly on Thailand, Southeast Asia. You'll have to figure out the differences between those. But that's kind of what we're going to be looking at. So, it seems like we've moved into this world where entrepreneurship is being sold as the easiest thing in the world. Anyone can do it. Just add water. You know, and <laughs> that's, that's kind of where we are. And, and that affects, unfor unfortunately, I'm going to say, affects a lot of important policy decisions in a lot of countries around the world. So what I want to talk about is some magic words that are bantered about all the time. You know, we talk about innovation ecosystems. But I want to make a distinction between ecosystems for innovators and the question of whether those ecosystems are actually innovative or not. Okay, So this is the distinction that we're going to look at here. Um, because as my friend Ed here, who's um, seen a lot of my talks, said, you know, don't do what we're doing here. Well, unfortunately, that's exactly what we're trying to do. And one of the messages here is I think it's, it's hurting us and wasting a lot of resources. So, Let's talk, this is a little bit of a review. If you've seen this before, um, this is a little bit of a review of the kind of the foundation of how I look at an ecosystem. So you know, let's look at uh, Silicon Valley versus developing countries or, or a lot of other places in the world. Okay, So and my students have heard this a million times, so you're going to have to bear with it again. Um, so my view of, of people in the world, you can cut people up in a whole different ways. You can cut them up as males or females or different nationalities or different cultures or whatever. But with the work I do and the things I'm interested in, I kind of cut people up this way. Okay? There are people who like to do new things and try things new and take risks and, and, and do it almost for the fun of it, whether it works or not. And then, then there's kind of this mass market, which is doing what mass market people do. They do things to get the, 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 you know, the silver card, then they get things, do things to get to the gold card, and then they do things to get to the platinum card, and so on and so forth. And that's kind of how mass markets are developed. And then there's a whole bunch of people over here who probably will never get it, and we don't really talk about them. Okay? But I'm always interested in this group here, and to the extent people want, how to move people here further that way. Okay? How to, you know, I'm not saying you have to jump over to here 
And all of us are here somewhere, right? We don't all innovate with every decision we make. You know, sometimes we just walk in and buy something. But I'm always hoping, just from a lifestyle choice, to get people to think a little bit more innovative about some aspect of their life. Okay? So that's kind of how I view people in the world. And then if you view people in the world and you start putting in a business context, you imagine how markets develop, okay? Again, this is pretty standard, straight out of a marketing textbook theory. You know, you a few of these in innovators down here start doing something and they, they sell it as a service and you're at the beginning of a new market. And if it continues to move that way, adding more people, this market begins to grow, all right? The, the so-called S-curve, okay? And if you put my terminology on it, and this is by no means a technical term, but if my terminology kind of fits something like this. You know, when you're down in here, the people are kind of saying, you know, I don't really know where we're going, but it feels like we're on to something. And if, if more and more people kind of come into the market and you learn your business models a little bit better, you know, you, you, you're in a growth stage where a path is beginning to, to emerge. And then while you're up, when you're up here, you know, we, you're in that world where everything is cut and dried. You know exactly what steps it takes to be a beginner, an intermediate, an advanced, you know, one star, five stars, ten stars, whatever the measurement is of the market that you're in. And if you think about it, most developed markets are built around weird measurements, you know, where we're getting awards for kind of moving up this path, you know. And um, so that's kind of how a market develops, right? So let's imagine <coughs> what we were doing if, if we're looking at the market of innovation or the market of entrepreneurship. Now this step is a little bit confusing, so I want to make sure we're clear before we go forward. I'm making a distinction between what we are able to do, the products we use, the services we use, that kind of stuff, versus the environment we are in. Okay, And the reason I'm making that distinction is we can talk about innovative products. We can also talk about the environment we're in. And today, I'm focusing on the second one. I'm making this distinction because most of us are used to, oh, Jerry, we were just talking about you. Okay, Most of us are used to thinking about innovation in this first context, you know, products start out very innovative, and they're, but they're kind of rough, and people don't know how to use them, only a small number of people try them, and then they get more polished, and they, they get financing behind them, and they get distributions, and they get easier to use. That's, that's what most of us view on innovation, but I'm talking about something else. I'm talking about how an environment for innovation develops and evolves. So, Taking that distinction, and by the way, feel free to ask a question if this is confusing, but you know, jump, jump right in. We'll have a conversation about this. But if we're taking this further, you know, we, we could say the same thing about being an entrepreneur, being an entrepreneur in an innovative environment or a non-innovative environment. So you know, I'm not talking about the product now. I'm talking about the act of being entrepreneurial. You know, there are places in the world Thailand is one of them, where you need to kind of find your own path. Right? If you, if you want to kind of go out and do something or start something new or, or whatever, you kind of need to find your own path. And we might be somewhere like around here a few years ago or down here. And the distinction I'm making is by the time you get up here, this is, this is where Silicon Valley is, right? It's not that innovative products and services aren't being developed here, but the act of being an entrepreneur is very straightforward, right? You know, exactly, you know, look in TechCrunch, look at, you know, meetups, find the first place that you want to do, make connections, you know exactly who to talk to for angel funding, you know exactly it's angel and then A round and this, that, and the other thing, and everything is laid out step by step. So the act of being entrepreneurial is very codified, all right? So that's the distinction I'm discussing about here. So, with that in mind, we can draw a, a contrast that Silicon Valley is probably responsible for creating very innovative products. But I argue that the pathway of entrepreneurship is not innovative. It's a well-trod path that all of you who are based around here kind of know where to follow now. It wasn't 30 years ago, it wasn't very true, but now it's a very clear path. And then you contrast that to where we are. Oops. 
perhaps, probably, the products being developed are less innovative, but the challenge of being an entrepreneur requires you to be a lot more innovative. You know, who you go to get mentorship, where you go to get funding, where you go to get support, where you go to cry on people's shoulders, you know, that's not very well defined. So that's the distinction that is underlying our discussion today, is how we develop that ecosystem, okay? And that's why I kind of argue that, at least for us viewing from the outside, you know, Silicon Valley is, is that supermarket. It's got everything, you know, exactly where to go. You know, everything is lined out nicely and, and, and uh, well organized. And then there's those of us out in the rest of the world in these, in these chaotic markets trying to figure out how do we get ourselves from these, these messy markets into something nice and organized and, and exciting like Silicon Valley. So that's what we're discussing. So Silicon Valley, entrepreneurs don't necessarily need to be that innovative as they go through the entrepreneurial process, although they may be making very innovative products. In developing countries and elsewhere, as I'm going to point out with an example, you know, entrepreneurs really need to find their own path still. You know, they need to figure out where they're going on their own. They're, they have to be innovators within that process, um, although their opportunities may come from more commonplace actions. Basic products that you take for granted, basic services you take for granted, getting distribution out there to places that you would take for granted uh, in a place like Silicon Valley or the West Coast. So this is the problem, all right? Imagine the supermarket, okay? Everyone else in the world is saying, God, we need a supermarket just like that. Well, we need to have that thing where we are. And that's what I want to discuss today and see how well that's working. So for the people who are around me, what does copying a Silicon Valley ecosystem mean? What does it look like? Well, you know, it's make more Googles. It's venture capital driven investment. It's spaces, creative spaces, okay? And it is really this feeling that entrepreneurship is a very clearly defined step-by-step -step process. That's the way it's viewed by policymakers in most of the rest of the world. I'll speak pretty well informed of, of Thailand, Southeast Asia, but I'm pretty sure from my experiences with colleagues around the world, this is kind of the belief outside, outside of here. Now, what does that mean? So, you know, what happens when you're trying to either bring this supermarket to an undeveloped market or you're an underdeveloped market and you want a supermarket, right? It's kind of the same question depending on where you stand. Now, I'm going to talk about one undeveloped market, all right? And the reason I'm using this example is I'm specifically not talking about developing countries here. I want to make it clear that undeveloped markets exist everywhere when we're talking about innovation, as you're going to see in a second. This is a story about Apple and Nokia. Now, I know you've heard about Apple. Have you heard of Nokia? I mean, it's a newer generation. Maybe Nokia didn't exist when you guys were alive, right? You've heard of Nokia. Nokia was the big phone before Apple came along, right? What year was the iPhone released? Well, the Apple iPhone, Apple became a phone company in 2007. Now, that's a very magical year for Nokia. Why is that such a magical year for Nokia? Any Nokia experts in here? Must be some telecom people in here, old holdovers from something. What was so important, 2007 was a very important year for Nokia, which actually had nothing to do with Apple, or everything to do with Apple maybe as you look at. 2007 was the highest sales year ever for Nokia. Okay, the highest sales year ever. And this is an important part of the story. So, you know, Nokia was down here in 1999. They grew and grew and grew and grew and grew up to here. And that, they hit the highest point in their growth in 2007. And then, yes, Apple came along. So they started to decline. And they held out for a little bit. And then they dropped a little and plateaued. But really, we, we know the rest of the story. OK? So what happened? Would, 
let, let's use all the typical hypotheses. They got big and stupid. You know, they didn't know what was going on. They didn't listen to their customers. What happened to Nokia? Anybody know? I'll offer uh, one opinion as a shareholder. Okay. Um, Are you still a shareholder? Yeah. Okay. They're coming back, actually, yeah. on the enterprise side. I couldn't tell you how many shares. It's insignificant. <laughs> okay. um, Nokia made the decision uh, when, when they were faced with the competition of the first smartphone from Apple uh, to try to put out the next generation smartphone as opposed to putting out something that was equally good. Okay. They failed, and so they lost out on the existing market, the replacement or the comparable market, and they had nothing for the future. Great. By the way, my, I don't know either. I'm going to give you my opinion as well. So any other so, thoughts? Hold, hold on just a second. Uh, Ed, would you really give a brief summary of that because I'm not sure how much the microphones in the room picked up what. Oh, what Ed said, sorry. What Ed said, yeah. Um, so Ed said he's a shareholder and he's not banking on any money from Nokia for his retirement. And um, basically he said Nokia tried to leap to a second generation smartphone when Apple came out with their first smartphone and that missed the entire replacement market that Apple was kind of creating. Any other thoughts? Actually, that's a good one. That's maybe better than mine. I'll use that next time. Okay. Any other theories? What happened to Nokia? I saw another hand here somewhere. Uh, it was the same. Similar, okay. Yeah, I, I heard the same story. Okay. So for me, um, the, the key point in this is this, this change from stupid phone to smartphone. Of course, they weren't stupid phones then. They were great phones then. But then it was a smarter phone that came along. All right. But there was a significant difference between a Nokia phone and what became called a smartphone. From a technology point of view, what was the significant difference? Sorry? App Store. Okay, yeah, that's a product. But I mean, from a technology point of view, what was the difference between a Nokia phone and an Apple phone? What became? Touch screen. Okay. What does that mean? Smartphone. Smartphone, okay. Versus a feature phone. Okay, the big difference is it went from a hardware device to a software device, right? So what Nokia did really, really well was a technology which was completely unusable in that new type of product. Their bread and butter product was this thing with 52 keys on it, little teeny keys, okay, right? It was a hardware phone. They knew how to make little keyboards. They lived in a mechanical world. Okay, our electromechanical world. The smartphone, or what we call a smartphone, became a software-driven device, right? Like all Apple products, they remove buttons. And they don't really remove buttons, they just make them into software buttons, right? That's what they're really doing. So um, I had a chance to uh, talk with Esko Eho, who is, one, a former prime minister of Finland, the youngest prime minister of Finland. He's 36 years old when he became prime minister. But after that, he became the vice president and joined Nokia's executive board in 2008. And when I was asked to go to this talk, I thought, this guy's just going to be making excuses. But he didn't make any excuses at all. He came right out and hit, and, you know, so 2008, he's, he's right there at the, the peak going down. You know, he presided over the failure of Nokia. And he was so honest about it. It was incredible. So what changed? You know, he said this, he said, you know, phones moved from being hardware oriented to software oriented. We were experts. Nokia was experts at making hardware driven phones, keyboards and that kind of stuff. More importantly, they knew it was happening. They had played with touch screens. They, they, it, there was no, it wasn't, a, they weren't blindsided in the sense that they didn't know it was happening. They weren't blindsided in the sense they didn't know the technology existed. They were blindsided by something completely different. They didn't have the ecosystem. And, and he said this when I was talking to him. He said, we did not have enough software engineers in Finland. We didn't have enough software engineers in all of Europe to compete with a software company in Silicon Valley. Right? It was a complete change in the way things were created and deployed. It included the App Store. It included touch screen, but those were enablers to a software world, a very flexible world, okay? Whereas the old phones were really built around keyboard and electromechanical devices. And his point was we had only one choice. We could have moved to Silicon Valley, and we discussed that. Again, they weren't oblivious to what was going on. 
they discussed the possibility. And they said, my God, that's such a risk. We don't know where this is heading. You know, it signals an entire failure of everything that we've done. And we're having our best sales ever. How do we tell anybody? How do we tell our shareholders about this move, right? And so you, you can, when you begin to hear this, you almost see the logic involved. In fact, I say to myself, would I have made a different decision if I were in the room? Now, the young people say, of course not, because you're an old person. But I would argue the same thing with, with any of us in the room. Could we, have, could we, in the face of that evidence, you know, best sales ever, and we have no, none of these resources anywhere near us for thousands of miles, could we make a strategic decision like that? This is the interesting thing. Well, I'll give you an example of somebody who's trying. So Ford, I picked this off of Verge uh, just a couple weeks ago, I think. I think this is only a couple. He was just here, right? Now, I'll tell you a, a side story. Um, Mark Fields is the CEO of Ford. Mark Fields used to be the CEO of Mazda. One of the things that got him to where he is today is he visited my business in Thailand. <laughs> I don't think he shares it with many people, so I'm telling you myself, okay? I've met Mark Fields, but, but what was interesting this, in, 2001, in 2001 when he visited, even then the Ford people were saying he's going to be CEO someday. I mean, so he has set up a, an apps company, basically a mobility company in Silicon Valley, really trying to head off some of what I think Nokia was, was a victim of. So interesting. We'll see how it turns out, okay? So what can we do, those of us not here? Well, we could move here. Ford's trying to, Nokia didn't. I'm not really willing to. Once a year is good, twice a year is good, but <laughs> there's some other things about Thailand which are fun, okay? We can copy Silicon Valley, or we can try something new. So what's the best thing we can do? We copy Silicon Valley, of course, right? And this is what policymakers do around the world. All right, and let's, let's look at how this turns out. So um, we're trying to copy this. Remember, one of, the, one of the biggest ingredients in our view of Silicon Valley, and we, we had some discussion, and I think we could even have some philosophical discussions if this is the main driver, venture capital. But one of the views of those of us not in Silicon Valley is venture capital drives every decision you make. All right? But the weird thing is, in the US, US VC funding is essentially flat. Now, Richard pointed out to me, if you get a little bit, I, I used a smoothing function on my graph. Same data, but smoothed it out a little bit more, but it did come up. Well, actually, I was also looking at the amount of money, not the number of deals. Yes. And that, of course, gets involved with how valuations track the general state of the economy. So that's actually a, a, probably a better indicator than I was using earlier. Yeah, in fact, I meant to I use number of deals here. The next slide, I actually unfortunately use value. I meant to use number of deals because I think that's more <laughs> appropriate from region to region because the values are so yeah, off. It, yeah. So in values, I mean, look at this, 1995 all the way through 2015, the only time it really changed appreciably, this is, this is the number of venture capital deals in the whole US. I'm not talking about Silicon Valley. It moves around regionally. You know, Silicon Valley draws from other places and Sometimes others flare up. But if you take all of the US, except for the 2001 debacle, when people learned, all right, VC has been flat. So even though we're maybe driving more customers through our, through our, through our ecosystem supermarket, our entrepreneurship supermarket, there's the same number of deals being done for 20 years now. Okay, so, and we're copying that? That's kind of weird, all right? It's like copying a business model where you're trying to grow the customers, but the supply is, is fixed. There's another part of the, uh, the explanation about venture capital, which I think is even more important for those of us not living here. So this is funding by, by key areas. Um, it's, it's basically in, in dollars. And uh, it's maybe too small to read down here, but this one is software. Then you get to biotechnology, you get to consumer products and services, media entertainment, IT services, and then you get down to a whole bunch of other things, industrial energy, financial services, medical devices, so on and so forth. Venture capital is extremely focused in what it works in. And this is true worldwide. 
And yet, those of us who live in other parts of the world are constantly thinking about, God, venture capital, we need venture capital. But even here in the mecca of venture capital, venture capital is extremely focused in only a couple of areas. In fact, even though there's a lot of categories there, I would argue, in the least, those first five are all software, right? Software is software. You'll give me that one for sure. <laughs> Biotechnology today is, is a software game. It's an information game. You know, bio, biotech companies rely heavily on information. It also goes back to gene sequencing. But the, the techniques are, are very much software techniques. And then you, when you get into consumer products and services, media entertainment, IT services, I mean, I'm assuming, I'm going to make the assumption here that those are heavily driven in, in software. So what it means is a huge chunk of the VC world is chasing IT and software. Now there's a problem with software for those of us who live everywhere else. Two problems actually. It's incredibly flexible and it's full of bugs. Now why is this a problem for Thailand? Well, First of all, any country-specific advantage we might get, like language, is extremely easy to drop into the next version, right? You can add languages to any software package, extremely easy. And anyone who has more, the more customers you have, the more bug fixers you have, right? So it's going to be very, very hard for a language-specific or a region-specific software industry to take off. Now, I know there's some exceptions. I'll try to deal with them in my way in a, in a few slides. But in general, if this is the software part of the you know, center of the world, it's going to be really, really hard to set up something new. Because software requires, requires a scale and benefits from the scale. Right? So how do you edge yourself in? You know, the only advantage is that we, we can, the only two I can come up with, language and accounting practices, right? Those are the two things that might make software different, but those are really easy to build into other versions of software. Hard to maintain that advantage, okay? So here's what we're looking at. You know, we're, we're looking at this vision, our, our, our policymakers, the people who, work, who I work with and, and unfortunately give me a lot of money to do, run programs and stuff, um, are trying to create something like Silicon Valley, but it's based on a couple of, of things that may not be true here, and the things that are true here are not applicable at all to our part of the world. Okay? So, so here are some views I have in, in errors of copying Silicon Valley. First of all, in general, Thailand's technical strengths aren't IT. There are some great coders and great programmers and there are some great programs from other parts of the world who have chosen to live in Thailand and code for wherever their customers are worldwide. But still, you don't really get the benefits of any Thai language advantage because the real advantage is here. Okay? There are some places who believe that they have hope, right? First of all, China is a closed IT market. The biggest advantage Chinese software companies have is no one else can get in there. Okay? India also has some hope, and they have the benefit of have, have had a strong IT services industry for many decades now, which has moved up the value chain. They also have the benefit of numbers, huge numbers of people who come and study here and then go back and take their capabilities. So India has a strong possibility of building. Israel is always cited as one of the up-and-coming places. They're backed by some great strengths in defense, you know, security and defense driven applications, but it's still a small company, eight million people, right? So Israel is, 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 is batting above its weight, punching above its weight for sure, but it's, it's still a small country. So it's really hard to imagine if we're going back to this and saying we need to build something like this somewhere else in the world, really, really hard to imagine how that's going to happen. Okay, hard for me to imagine. I, I can introduce you to a lot of people who imagine it all the time. <laughs> okay? So, the other thing we can, we can get on then is, well, 
what about stuff that Thailand is good at? And Thailand is good at a lot of things. Okay, two of them, very, very good at agriculture. We got some great cutting edge, world-class agriculture technology. Anybody heard of a VC firm investing in agriculture? It does happen, but if you dig deeply, it's almost always an IT-related connection back, back to agriculture. So even in the US, with all the agriculture research, research going on here, all the venture capital activity going on here, nobody has found a venture capital model for, for agriculture. And of course, things like tourism, right? Great industry, very innovative industry, hospitality. But it's, that also isn't built around a innovation or doesn't really allow a Silicon Valley type uh, innovation ecosystem. Now, are, are these really right for venture-based ecosystems? That's kind of the, the problem I have when I look at this challenge. So what can we do? Um, I crossed the first one off early, all right? Hopefully, we're, we're beginning to agree that it's going to be hard to copy. So now we're, we're left to the undesirable one. We've got to do something new. We need to try something new. So let's choose an ecosystem to build. OK, we talked about IT already. Let's cross that one off. We talked tourism, hard to imagine. Agriculture, hard to imagine. But what about an ecosystem built on problems? Okay, this is, this is the, the next step. Uh, some of you have heard my earlier presentations. This is the evolution of, of that thinking. What if we built an ecosystem built on the problem rather than the technology? Here's how the thinking goes. First of all, let me give you some history. Um, a little bit of history of, of actually how Silicon Valley came along, but just a little bit. I got criticized by Somebody last time I gave some history, they said, don't come in here and tell us about Silicon Valley history, <laughs> OK? Um, but originally, you know, if, if you, if you kind of look at some of the stuff, you know, the, the modern venture capital kind of came out of the Boston area. There was this guy at Harvard who, um, you know, said, hey, we got some business sense. And, and those guys down at, Har at MIT have got a whole bunch of technologies. The war has ended. What do we do with them? All right? So the, the, the original seeds of modern venture capital came from trying to find consumer applications, or let's say other applications, industrial applications, for war technologies. So this is the 50s. Radio is one of those. In fact, radio figured prominently in, in the formation of the Silicon Valley ecosystem. Okay? But again, it was radio. Right? We have this technology. We can, we can broadcast radio waves. We can transmit information radio waves. Now what do we do with it? Well, that became successful. And those were the first stages where Fred Terman began to really build what would become called Silicon Valley. Although if he had been real successful with radio, it would have been vacuum tube valley, I guess. But, so he didn't get radio to really catch on, but it really began to cement his thinking and that moved on to the next step, where it really became silicon-based, OK? Now we've got transistors, another kind of war, post-war technology. But it was also a technology seeking a problem. In those days, they didn't know what to do transis with transistors. They knew it was going to revolutionize everything. But, but how? And so that moved on. In fact, there's a step in between here I could probably put in here. It's when these transistors started going on chips, which kind of comes into some of our vintage, right? Um, and uh, you know, what do we do with these semiconductors? And that, that's what it was when I was a kid. And as a high school, and when I was in high school, you know, semiconductor manufacturers would make little, what they called computers. My first computer was something called a Kim-1. There might be three people in the room who would know what that was, a Kim-1. The whole purpose of that was just to get people using the 6502 chip on there. Had one kid memory, no storage. <laughs> All hexadecimal input machine language. Okay, again, there were hobbyists. We didn't know what to do with it. We just we saw this. We we imagined this future, but we just didn't know what that future was going to hold. Okay, PC same way. When PCs first came out, I remember um, in high school people like Apple running ads. Look at all the stuff you can do on a PC. Actually, they wouldn't have said that. Sorry, on a microcomputer. Look at all the things you can do on a microcomputer. Keep recipes, keep address books, keep, you know, they're trying to tell us what we might use a computer for, a, a microcomputer in those days. But again, it's a problem. I mean, it's a kind of a solution or a technology still trying to find that, 
that problem. <coughs> Begin to happen with the internet. And in fact, the internet was actually a war technology if you go far enough back. Same way, you know, we have this internet, we built this internet so that we could bomb ourselves to oblivion and the internet would still survive, okay? But there wasn't any consumer applications with it. After a while, a couple of scientists, not even computer scientists, physicists started sending email back and forth and collecting things together in what would be the World Wide Web. But it was still lacking in a, in a, a product or a need. So our entire world of in innovation ecosystems up until now, up until now are solutions seeking problems. I'm trying to turn that around. What about ecosystems based on problems searching for solutions? We live in a part of the world that has lots of problems. You live in a world that has no problems, right? But lots of solutions, okay? So why would we chase after a method which doesn't fit? So here's what I'm proposing as the next possible step Wicked problem is worth working on. Now, wicked problem is actually a technical term. As some of my students know, they love this word, OK? Wicked problem is actually a word that was uh, a term that was coined by a development expert from UC Berkeley. It's, it's not meant to be a, you know, a, a millennial term or a, or a marketing term. It actually has a technical connotation. It's a, it's a very, very complex, complex problem. <coughs> so. I'm trying to imagine how to define these wicked problems worth working on, which then become ecosystems. So how do we set a methodology to find these wicked problems? Now, the reason I, I'm keen on this methodology is for a couple reasons. Is I believe for the ecosystem to work, it needs to somehow attract both investors and entrepreneurs, right? Just like it did 50 or 60 years ago in, in those early days coming out of the war, a small number, a very small number of, of investors with a new idea of how investing could be saw, let's take these technologies and build an ecosystem around it. I'm suggesting the same thing. We find that we're, we're able to identify a small number of investors, and they're out there, as I'll show you, Small number of investors say, hey, we should be investing in problems rather than investing in solutions. And encouraging, therefore, encouraging entrepreneurs and all of them coming around to a certain point, to a single point where the ecosystem grows. And that's the challenge, is how to get a well-defined, wicked problem. Okay? I've chosen a number. This is fairly arbitrary. There's a little bit of hopefully educated guess into it, but fairly arbitrary. 10 to 50 million people. The goal is to be focused enough to attract those investors and entrepreneurs, because there are investors interested in specific areas. And hopefully, if it's focused enough, an entrepreneur can imagine working in a certain area. So I'm arbitrarily saying 10 to 50 million people. For that desire for scale, I'm, I'm suggesting our methodology includes looking for problems that go across a country barrier, right? It's, that's more interesting from an international point of view. And the, the overall goal of this is we are able to define a well-defined problem which is used to align entrepreneurs and investors and other resources into an in innovation ecosystem. Because when you think about it, that's all that happens in this supermarket called Silicon Valley, is everything, all these resources, financial, human, and technical resources get aligned more or less in one single area. That's what makes it work. And that's what I'm hoping we're able to do from a, another point of view, and that is from the problem rather than solution. Now, where am I looking for inspiration for this methodology? The, by the way, the methodology is important because I think if you're able to show a methodology or describe a methodology, it adds credibility to those people you're trying to bring in, both on the investor side and the entrepreneur side. So, we, the terminology we use in our program is explore, experiment, execute, but essentially it's, design, it's, it's, it's a design thinking sort of philosophy. Now, design thinkers or, or designers, you know, the IDOs and the frog designs and continuums and those guys, believe that they've got a process for creating good designs. And if you go back in history, 15 or 20 years, they focus that process on products. 
And then over time they said, hey, this doesn't only have to be for products, it can also be for services. And then going more closely to the present, they started saying, hey, it doesn't even have to be for services, it can be for the entire brand or strategy of our company. And that's kind of where we are here. So all I'm suggesting really is, can we use that same process for 50 million people? T 10 to 50 million people, okay? So product is kind of one scale of that design thinking. Services scale a little bit further. Strategy and brand scale a little bit further. Can we take it to a regional level? Can we still apply a design thinking methodology to a regional level to get a well thought out problem, not solution? So sometimes we use this terminology 10, 10, 10, right? Easy to remember. Okay, so we're trying to imagine 10 wicked problems worth working on which offend 10 million people. 50 just doesn't fit in here, but uh, okay. To be solved over 10 years. Again, ecosystem venture capital-like timelines, right? Not, not quick fixes, but good long-term problems that, that really are gonna attract people into those area, areas. So, and I, I believe if we get this methodology down well, we'll be able to galvanize entrepreneurs, investors to come together and, and maybe change the way we look at ecosystems, all right? So my assumption is that the, the method is part of the whole intrigue, that people get turned on by, by this method, not just some arbitrary definition of water or poverty or rural, but by having a good methodology that attracts these kind of people who say, hey, that's what I want to be part of. So that's our next step. Um, I hear this all the time, I hear this statement all the time, you know, I talk to investors, investors, I get an investor calling me every week saying, hey, you know, I've got money, I want to invest, in, you know, I, I looked up some number, impact investors, supposedly $700 million they're trying to deploy to solve problems around the, 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 around the world. So there's a lot of money out there, and I get calls, emails all the time, and if I suggest anything, the answer is always, well, there's not a market for that. But I mean, how can there not be a market if there's a problem that big? Right? So that's why I'm trying to imagine this step from problem, problem to market. And if we can get that, then we've taken the next step to building the ecosystem. So that's what I consider my next step in, in the development we're working on. If you have me back next year, I'll tell you how to do it. <laughs> I haven't figured it out yet. Okay? But really, that's what we're trying to do is, is have problem-based ecosystems that achieve the same thing that's happening in Silicon Valley, but use one resource that we have a lot of, and that's problems. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. So let me ask the first question. <coughs> so this idea of uh, building, maybe not an ecosystem, but certainly building a startup company around a problem is not unknown here either. A lot of people would say that's the way Uber came about, right? Yep. Uh, no taxis in San Francisco. So what's it going to look like? Do you think that the system, especially in Southeast Asia, is going to look more at infrastructure, or do you think it's going to look at consumer demand? What, what's going to be the driving things? Okay, so th this is a great question that I don't know the answer to, okay? <laughs> because um, I've, I've been experimenting with this for about three years. I've got some guinea pigs in the room and, and many others, okay? We've experimented with, with MBA students. We've experimented with researchers. And we're always trying to find, figure out how to define this wicked problem. And one thing that happened, there's, there's two things that happen, which, which I don't believe is what I'm heading for. Either somebody jumps to a solution immediately, which I'm trying to stop, or it's defined at a scale which is ideal as a startup company, like an, like an Uber. Yeah. So what I'm suggesting is, and I'm admitting I don't know the way, what I'm suggesting is if there's a way to think one scale above that. So the problem with an Uber not Uber as it exists, but an, an Uber-like in, uh, something in the developing world is there isn't an ecosystem around it. So yeah. all the benefit you have, in, have an ecosystem here, we're talking about this just before class, right? There's 15 people all making a similar company in any one thing, you know, Airbnb or Uber or whatever it is. There's lots of people sharing ideas all in the same area. There's lots of investors with money out there playing in a similar area. So. If it's, a, if it's a single problem and a single company not here, that company has very little chance of moving forward. So how do we scale up one magnitude so it's no longer company-sized, it's, it's region-sized, so that now 
a handful of investors are there, a handful of entrepreneurs or more are there, and now there's some healthy competition, there's some healthy sharing of ideas, that ecosystem. So in my mind, it's really a difference of scale, and I don't. Okay. I agree. It, it so far in my efforts, it's always collapsed either to a solution or it's collapsed to a problem, to a, a, a scale, a company scale problem. But if we could keep it at a higher scale, I think we could allow multiple entrepreneurs and multiple investors to come together. Yeah, I'm actually familiar with one example in the province of Quebec, Canada, where the province got together and they held a conference on problems. They said most conferences are innovation are about solutions, and they took exactly this line, and they basically had people come out who made presentations about the problems, and I don't know what follow-up they did, right? I don't know yeah. if the entrepreneurs and the investors sitting in the room actually were able to talk to each other and coordinate things. But of course, you know, in their situation, one of the problems was manufacturing facilities that no longer had any use, right? Yeah. I remember that being a big thing. Uh, I uh, wanted to uh, kind of drill down on this just a little bit more. Uh, and the, um, yeah, the, the uh, issue is, go you know, who's going to do it? Who do you think it is? Is this something that the government could bring the right people in the room? And who are the right people in the room? Uh, no. Um, uh, my belief is, is no on that. Um, because, I hope this is still on. Or it not, is. Not broken. It, the light's on. <laughs> okay. Um, the, uh, you know, the, we talked about this a little bit earlier. The, the government people I know, and, and they're big supporters of what I do. I should scramble the next part because I know this is on video. Um, you know, they mean well, and they want to do good things, but they're not going to take a risk. So it's a lot easier to say, hey, let's do what Silicon Valley is doing. And that's why we see this proliferation everywhere. You're never going to say, hey, it's stupid to do what Silicon Valley is doing. You know? You know, it, so government doesn't do that as well. But, if, but there, are, there are investors out there with a lot of money. There are entrepreneurs out there who want to solve lots of problems. And by the way, this comes from my experience. I've, I've worked for about 10 or 15 areas in this, 10 or 15 years in this area that's sometimes called social entrepreneurship. And you get lots of different business models, and they never, they never come together in kind of an area. So that's what I'm hoping to do is take that next step. Instead of one guy working on rural area and one guy working on crime in the city, you know, let's get people to to really come around a problem in a, in a big way. It's kind of like what Bill Gates was trying to do with the global health challenges. Although, in my opinion, most of the global health challenges are, are, are more solution-based rather than problem-based. Yeah. One last comment for me, and then I'll open, open the floor. Uh, one kind of interesting thing about this is that in the product-driven innovation, if you would, the solution-driven innovation, one of the things that you see is you see people who have a thing, right? And they are unable to have the flexibility to see other applications for it. <coughs> and I think there is a danger in this solution that people think they know what a problem is, and they don't have the flexibility to redefine the problem and look at it in a new and different way. Yeah, that's the key of that methodology. Defining a problem is actually one of the hardest things you can do. I've been researching this for about five years. I've not found a good way to define a problem. It's harder than it sounds. The so. design thinking approach, though, is a really good idea yeah. because you look at it from different angles. You try small solutions early yep. and really get them out into the market. Yeah. yeah, OK, let's open the floor. Bevan. Hi. I give you a problem there. You define your problem as a wicked problem. Yeah. And you so the wicked problem is that when you define it, it changes. Now, if the problem keeps changing, government will not be able to support it. Yeah. Venture capitalists don't want that either. So maybe you should have changed the definition of the problem you work on. Yeah. I, actually, you bring up a very interesting point, because you're right. One of, the def, one of the technical definitions of wicked problems are they actually change as you're trying to solve them, or, or your understanding changes as you're trying to solve them, and they're moving all the time. So let me just tell you a little bit about how we got to wicked problem. I used to call them grand challenges. Um, 
and I had two problems with grand challenges. Number one, most of the grand challenges I've seen defined, which includes the, the Gates grand challenges for global health, the Canada grand challenges, even the Academy of Engineering's grand challenges, they're all solution-based, technology-based. Okay? You know, Gates's list is an incredible list, but it's, you know, make refrigerated, uh, make uh, vaccines that don't need to be refrigerated. Great, I can see the value of that, but that's different than what I was trying to do. So that was one problem with grand challenges, but I was still okay with it then. But then I gave a presentation like this a few years ago to a whole bunch of senior scientists, and one of the senior scientists started calling his work grand challenges. And so grand challenges in Thailand became what he wanted to work on, what the other scientists. So unfortunately, I can't use grand challenges, so I, I kind of got into wicked problems. But you're right, wicked problems... It's a cool name, but it, it doesn't exactly follow the definition. So, Actually, I saw your hand first. Oh, yeah. You. So you mentioned that the government in Thailand or in other developing countries try to copy Silicon Valley. Yeah, I've um, seen this worldwide. Yeah, everywhere. Could, could, could you please elaborate more on what exactly they are trying to do? Sure. Um, usually you build, build a big building. Okay. You put in uh, a space, uh, a, a creative space. You know, which has games in it, bean bags, stuff like that. You put a whole bunch of little offices in, which will be startup offices. You encourage venture capital to come in, and then you have lots and lots of events, usually inviting people from Silicon Valley to come over and speak. Okay. So this would be, for example, maybe Singapore or Malaysia? Or? Every country in the world, actually every region in the world besides Boston and, and San Francisco and maybe Seattle and Austin and Cambridge, okay. maybe Tel Aviv. Everywhere we've else. Got, we've already got the beans bags. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. But everywhere else, even even regions in the U.S. try to do this. Okay. It, it's more, they feel it's more the physical space rather than the, the, the glue and the networking. Uh, I have two separate uh, points to make. Um, one is, I find your approach very innovative, and I think it is wonderful. You know, it's not just blindly copying Silicon Valley. And so one, as an aside, I will talk about Silicon Valley, uh, is that uh, in terms of the ecosystem, well, what has happened, and this is just something that everybody knows, so it's nothing to be discussed, because the more important thing is this one, is that, of course, when you have an ecosystem like this and a proliferation of companies, what, has been, what I'm seeing, at least in the newspapers for the last couple of years, is, of course, the driving out of the lower-wage workers. Of course. And, and, of course, the lower-wage workers now include <coughs> teachers, professors, <laughs> you know, insurance agents and all that. Everybody's low-wage who is in a Silicon Valley millionaire. Yeah, you're right. And, of course, you do see homeless families and children. Yeah. You know, in fact, there's this bus called Hotel 22, which mm. is an uh, you know, overnight bus. So that's another problem. Uh, and, again, that, so copying blindly Silicon Valley will lead to other problems in other countries with more disastrous results. Yeah. My more I agree. I agree with that, and that's happening in places like India, yeah. where brand new cities come in and everyone else is pushed out. The brand new city is built around uh, an, an information IT hub or something like that. So I agree with yeah. you. Yeah. But my more important thing is, I was actually just at the connecting the dots symposium. I would be happy to, you know, leave this with you. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that um, Dr. Marcia McNutt, uh, she spoke about. She's the editor-in-chief of Science Magazine and, and you know, with her totally experience yeah. and everything else, she talked about, she mentioned, uh, of course, the whole f focus is on energy, climate change, and so on. And one of the things she mentioned was that she felt that in the developing countries, again, the copying mentality, and I think it isn't necessarily developing countries. I think it has always been very much the premise of Western economies. We need economies. to keep this short yeah, yeah, because yeah. I have to tell you, this is all going to go on YouTube. They tend not to pay attention to what's happening in the audience. And so, really, I'm going to have to ask Ed to do a real brief right. summary so that some of this content can come back. So, so energy efficiency, looking at alternative sources of energy in developing countries. Great. I mean, I agree with you. That's why um, my view of the world is this. It's not developing versus developed. And that's why I put the Nokia example in there. I mean, Finland, nobody would in, in, accuse Finland of being a developing country. But when the technology changed, it's, it doesn't have what it needs to do that. So this is the way I view the world. There's, there's some people here, and there's a whole bunch of people who love to follow what's going on. Yeah, OK. Good. Go ahead. I feel like uh, people invest in, investors invest in people, and peop like founders have, they treat their venture as like their baby. But if you flip it and you find people to work on your problems, when the going gets tough, why won't they just stop? Because they don't have that drive that the founders here do. 
No, there's no change. The, the, the founder is still going to be working on their venture. Their venture is still going to be solving a problem, just like a venture here is solving a problem. Actually, we had an interesting discussion that's related to this at lunch. Because a lot of, of entrepreneurs really start their companies <coughs> because they want to change the world. They see a match. If it's solution driven, they see a match between something they've got and a real world problem. And in the process of growing a company, the company almost has to gradually transition away from the entrepreneur's ownership and to the ownership of investors whose primary interest is financial return. And this is something structural that happens because a lot of entrepreneurs stop too quickly if they're not really pushed by investors to keep growing their companies. Yeah. Was that but your that's, a, that's a very good, you know, very you, you, interesting I point. don't think we you got to the end of your question. Yeah. I, feel like, I feel like, so a lot of people, a lot of founders have, like, personal interest, and <coughs> that's why they stick through it, to get to that phase. But I feel like if it's this way, it, imagine it's like, you have a kid, or you, okay, this is a really bad example, but if you're asked to take care of your friend's child at, like, your house, and, like, something happens, you would go to your kid first, so you wouldn't yeah. worry about, if no, it you, was your idea. What you're, what you're suggesting, or, and, and I didn't mean to imply this, so what, you, what you're suggesting is, is I'm going to, come help me with my problem. That, that's not the point. There, there's people all over the world who are interested in different challenges. They want to work in water. They want to work in rural poverty. Um, from that point of view, I don't think those problems are defined focused enough in order for an ecosystem to build around it. So if, if you're interested in water problems, for example, the idea would be to define the problem more narrowly so that, so that, first of all, affects about 10 to 50 million people. That attracts a whole bunch of people who are working on their ventures but are interested in that area and attracts investors who are investing in what they want to invest in in that area. Just like people come here because they want to code, they want to be in IT, they want to invest in IT. So it's, it's, it's really not, I'm not telling you to come solve my problem. I'm just saying there are people out there and if it's focused enough and the money's there, they're gonna, they might go that way. But in a sense, you can't own a problem like you can own the solution, right? In terms of being you know, the person listed on a patent or having the business or whatever. Yeah, I'm skeptical about those, but yeah, I Well, agree. But, yeah. but you know, the whole idea of ownership, how important is that to entrepreneurship? Yeah. Um, one of the things is that I think it was significant that your comment comes from India because a lot of this really looks like what has happened with bottom of the pyramid businesses, especially, you know, that was so famous and, and really has developed very far in India. Yeah. Um, are you seeing a lot of entrepreneurs in Southeast Asia who are really working on those kinds of problems? Is this really actually developing now or is this still something that's an egg of an idea? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, so uh, again, I th and this goes back to the question that this guy just asked, there are lots of people interested in the bottom of the pyramid, but the bottom of the pyramid is very, very broad. And that, that's one of my concerns is resources are stretched very, very thin. So if suddenly you said, hey, we're going we're gonna to put a lot of effort in this one area, I think it would attract people, just like some people are attracted here because there's opportunities in IT. I don't think they necessarily come here just because their solution matches what's here. It, you know, there's a give and take. And so, same way, the bottom of the period is, is very thin and very broad, and if we were able to define some much clearer challenges, wicked problems in those areas, 50 million people or so, I think it would hopefully coagulate some effort rather than spreading it so thinly. That's the challenge. I, most solutions I see are village by village, and they never go beyond that, that scale, and that, that's an unfortunate use of resources. I'll let you call. <laughs> Charlotte, I saw your hand. Uh, let's see, uh, this is sort of a quagmire. <laughs> to, uh, I, I want to suggest that your it could be simpler than, than your you're making it harder than it than it is. And a good example of what you're describing is is what the country of Chile has just recently done. Mm -hmm. So Chile is, I think, I would say that Chile is now in like a second generation of evolving their innovative ecosystem. I think they're they're not quite fast making an ecosystem for innovators, but they're, you know, getting the mindset yeah. of, of, of wanting, of causing everybody across the whole populace of, say, 16 million people, wanting to be innovative. And it's proven by the, by the Swedish statistician that 
Chile is about 1965 America on, you know, that's the, so uh, they just said, what are we best at, and what can we, what can we, you know, wrap innovation around? So that happens to be copper, and now they've come out with a whole roadmap for 10 years, mm -hmm. and how are we going to make, apply innovation and make, you know, copper move forward and be the leading edge? So what would that thing be, that one area, I mean, maybe it's, you know, whatever it is, you're, you're from Thailand, you should know what that one really fabulous ecosystem is that's... that's yeah, I think that's easier with 60 million than it is with 80 million, but, but really what I'm interested in is a challenge beyond Thailand. I'm, I'm interested in this idea that you can define a series of problems and attract people from around the world. So I, I'm, I'm actually not a policy person and I'm really not interested in, in country policy. I'm really interested to see how we could adjust the way people innovate it. it, it took, probably just one step above what you're suggesting. But I agree, that's one way, is just to kind of choose one for each country or community or something like that. I agree with that, yeah. So at the level of individual entrepreneurs, are you seeing people who are not attuned well enough to market needs or to the ecosystem around a particular solution? Some people I see are incredibly attuned to market needs, but their market is a single village. Uh -huh. I mean, incredibly attuned, they, they are, in that village, they are part of the fabric. It, you cannot be more attuned to the needs. And I'm just wondering, how do we pull that out a little bit and then do so it a thousand times? One of the reasons I ask this is, at the early, in the first session, we looked at the rate of percentage of the population who are involved in entrepreneurial activities. And it's quite high in Thailand. Yep. So in a sense, you see a high percentage of people in the population, but the efficiency and there's, an, there's, another message, uh, there's another measure which isn't measured in many of those studies, and this, it's kind of an invention measurement. And, and I don't mean invention like in gadgets and that kind of stuff. I'm talking about people that just solve their, a problem in their immediate area. They, they help their kids at the school. They fix this thing or they fix that thing. And that's, that's an inventor role. And what I'm imagining is, how do you, once somebody's come up with that solution, how do you make it happen 500 times? something like that. And, and how do you reward investors and entrepreneurs for being that, that scale? The, my students know that my view of the world is these are inventors, this is the mass market, and somewhere in here are the people who take this invention and try to get it to larger numbers of people. So that's the, the view I have. Just like a Bill Gates or a Steve Jobs said, hey, here's this, this home computer, how do we put it on more desks around America? Something like that. We, I've seen some great incredibly innovative ideas in, in Southeast Asia and in, and in India. I just never see them go any further. Um, and I'm not saying they should, but I'm saying there's an opportunity if we can make those go further, maybe not for the individual inventor, but for somebody to, to get it more widespread. Yeah. And we learned in, in Richard's seminar that there's one place where China is actually out innovating Silicon Valley, and that's in e-commerce. Um, I've heard that if you look at sophisticated e-commerce sites in China, it makes Amazon look like it's 10 years old or outdated. Now, if you look at the demographics, China, uh, uh, I think, has 110 cities with over a million people. The United States has either 9 or 10, <coughs> and San Jose would be the 10th. Okay? So you just don't have the distribution of mega cities, in effect, where high density e commerce works, where you can do one hour shipping, three right. hour shipping, 24 hour shipping, that kind of thing, right? So, are there examples like that in Southeast Asia where playing to the strength of what Southeast Asia has, in that case, it's China's population density? Um, well, uh, what I'm arguing actually is the, 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 the opportunity is the problems. Right, that there are, there are a common set of problems. There are unique problems to every part of the region, but there are some common problems that, that cut across the region, which I think we can bring together and find investors and entrepreneurs to, to go after. But I'm just looking for maybe a specific example, one or two. I mean, uh, I mean if I was going to move into a specific example, anything having to do with over, overuse of of aquatic or agricultural resources okay. is, is a big, I mean, all the countries except for Singapore and Brunei are very, very agricultural. So uh, that would be the first place to start your search or, or my search is, is in those areas. Uh, then there's water management. There's a whole bunch of things related to that. Cool. There's a hand up here many times. Um, yeah, so simple question. What challenges do entrepreneurs face in Thailand? Um, so that can be answered in a number of different ways. So the way I would answer is 
they put a challenge on themselves. It, okay, depends on what you want, expect from the entrepreneur. But many entrepreneurs in Thailand don't have the same uh, desire to build a company here like somebody would build a company here. Um, you said at lunch, what was your profile of an of a Asian entrepreneur or? They become comfortable once they start to generate profit. Right, there's a certain so comfort. There's a certain comfort. It doesn't take long to be comfortable. It's and easier to manage a small company. Easy to manage, to and you get a certain amount of prestige. Of you can be on as many panels as you want to speak on. You know the, the reward structure. In fact, I was telling Richard at lunch. There's a great opportunity, I think. So a, a medical student in Indonesia was sent out in a village, like they all are, to, to work for two years. And this is a project we work with. And he found out that people only came to the clinic be when they had money. Not when they were sick, they came when they had money. Very, very poor part of Indonesia. And so he set up a system, bring plastic bottles to me every month. Bring this many plastic bottles to me any mo every month. And whenever, and, and then he recycles them. And whenever you're sick, you just come to the clinic. He calls it garbage clinical insurance. Brilliant idea. Brilliant idea. And he's evolved. He's worked on this for two years. He's got menus, you know, exactly how much to bring, how many plastic bottles, how much newspaper, how much this. I mean, he's evolved in a very systematic way. But he loves his village. He loves the local area he's working on. He's gotten worldwide fame. Prince Charles has been there and had his picture taken. He gets flown somewhere every month. He takes one of his staff with him every month. He's got everything he needs, if not more, from that project, and I would love to see him do it a thousand more times. Um, we've told him we can bring investors in, we can bring operations people in. He's happy with what he's got, and I can't say there's anything wrong with that, but that would be one of the biggest things in, te in terms of, if you're talking about an entrepreneur that you would see in this area, it wouldn't be cool to stop at low scale here. It sounds like what Thailand is lacking in that circumstance is something what we would call in Silicon Valley a search fund, which is money looking for you know, like a capable entrepreneur or somebody who could fill, the, fill those shoes and be like, listen, here is a problem. In fact, in that case, you have a solution already set up. We just want you to do it in 20 other villages. Just to scale this out. Right. Yeah. Right. the company from 30 people to 300 Different. people. Right, so why doesn't that exist? People. But I think it's actually, at a more fundamental level, it's the social pressure. It's the, it's the social reward. So in, if, you're not, if you're chatting someone about a bar here, if you're not talking about you're going to grow it a gazillion times, you're not cool. You know, when you're in Thailand it's a, or, or anywhere else in Southeast Asia, it's a different set of social values. And so I think most of us are motivated a lot by our social environment. And this social environment motivates you in a different way than the social environment. So that's, that's the thing that's going to be a challenge. There's not a lot of role models to look to. There's not a lot of people who you're trying to outdo. There's not a lot of people who are saying, hey, you're cool if you keep making it bigger. You're pretty cool doing what you've done. So Actually, this kind of comes back to your question earlier, right? What <coughs> happens if you lose interest in the problem, right? Does, do they just walk away? Because uh, most people are very aware of the problems right around themselves. Yeah. But scaling beyond that to larger groups is really hard. Go ahead. Um, actually, talking about the search fund model, I think uh, one reason that it won't work well in Asia is because most of business is family owned. Like, I think for search fund, we've got different, basically four steps. We've got fundraising, search for ideas, and actually m and aid or join a, vent, a company and act, finally exit strategies. Yeah. But the thing, the harder things, I could imagine in Asia is even though this company is profitable, they won't really want to just sell it to you because they really have kind of passion or love into the company they created. Sure. And that's one thing is not it's quite different compared to the Western culture. Yeah, social values that are really and it's the company is my child, yeah. I'll never and, sell it. Well yeah. and then my question is uh, can you briefly introduce about What's the current uh, startup situation like in Thailand or in general in East, East, uh, Southeast Asia? Yeah, so uh, again, region-wise, it's, it's not, not too, too different than anywhere else. So the, a lot of the effort is in IT and app com uh, companies. Um, the biggest companies in, uh, sorry, the biggest startups in any of the countries tend, tend to be language-specific or some other idiosyncrasy with that country, which means they're, lim they're capped already how far they can go. Okay, so you're, you know, companies in Thailand are $10 million companies. 
you know, because that's, that's what they're going to reach. And, you know, companies in Malaysia, same way. Companies in, even companies in Singapore, you know, they, Singapore is trying to promote itself, but it really hasn't had any big breakthroughs either because the markets, if you're doing, if you're trying to find a market which is unique to Southeast Asia in IT, it's a really small market. And it's a market that outside IT can, can move in really quickly and take. There, they manipulate the price for real estate in Thailand. Right? No way. I mean, the Thais are manipulating the price in Thailand. Yeah. No, no. Okay, so you're, you're talking about a whole new industry. I mean, property is a big industry. It's a, it can be a very innovative industry. It's a highly competitive industry. Um, but that's not, I mean, it, and it's a great industry. It's an interesting industry. It doesn't really fit into this discussion of, you know, venture capital innovation ecosystem. I mean, if you go to Thailand, hotels are really, really cool and innovative. Shopping malls, if you like them, are really cool and innovative. You know, there are places where Thailand is, you know, hospitals, people fly around the world to Thai hospitals. So, I mean, there are places which are truly best in the world. They just don't fit in this venture ecosystem. But uh, if you need anything done in a hospital, it's the best place to go. In fact, it's great to go to hospitals when you're not sick. So they're basically hotels. Do you think people in Asia, come, kind of back to the social values thing, do you think you'll be able to get people in Asia speaking frankly enough about the problems to really develop focused problems you can work on? Because there's an awful lot of unwillingness. You know, don't hire a consultant because we shouldn't admit that we need a consultant, right? Yeah. That, that kind of attitude I see quite a bit. Yeah, it's true, and, and it's a good question because um, this may be one of the barriers to getting more focused definition of problems. So many of the pro lots of problems are discussed, but they're discussed at what I call newspaper headline level, you know, which means they're just water, poverty, corruption. I mean, that is such a broad, that's not a problem, that's an issue. And those need to be broken into clearly defined, you know, corruption could be broken down into probably hundreds of, of clearly defined problems um, that then could be tackled. And then, then you, once, once you get focused, now somebody's in a target. But when yeah. there corruption in general or water in general, it, it doesn't, nobody's in the target crosshairs at that point. So how much have you talked about this to people in the government or in other groups that might move on this? Oh, I talk to this, about, to this about everyone. So we've okay. got a collection of... Because uh, there, uh, my, my question is, what kind of reactions are you getting? Are you getting an interest on the part of the people who have the resources who would actually start a program like this? Yeah, actually, I'm not worried about the resources because um, I've got enough in, uh, in, impact investors in the region. And we've, we've kind of created a group, which includes 16 of these people, whether they like it or not, but also um, people in other countries through, through our Southeast Asian network, uh, people from UNICEF and, and some of the other uh, aid organizations who are developing entrepreneurs. So we've got a good group. What, I, what, I need to t what I'm telling myself with this presentation is we really need to, to spend an effort on the methodology. And so I've been trying to search whether a methodology exists, haven't really found one. I'm getting some help from Frog Design. Mm -hmm. um, the CEO of Frog Design has gotten mm -hmm. interested in this. So w it's really a design thinking methodology and how to apply that a at a larger level. Okay. So I think on that note, probably we should call an end to the formal part of today's session. We've got some refreshments outside. Hope you'll stay and, and talk informally with each other and also with Ed. First of all, thanks so much for a really thought-provoking presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me.